Um, if I can recommend a missionary biography, I highly recommend that you read William Carey's biography. We have copies, I think, in the back of uh, that uh, that book. Uh, it's such a such a wonderful story of a man who is so taken by the gospel that he decides he wants to take it to India uh, when nobody else really was engaging in the work of missions. So his work was having to break the ground first in the UK uh, and getting people to see and understand that this was something that the church was actually called to do. They, they had come to believe that the Great Commission did not apply to the Christians uh, of their day anymore, that that was only for the apostles. And every, that's what they understood in pulpits, that's what they preached. Uh, but Kerry took that on and said, this is our work. And even though it is true that we're not going to be able to uh, individually carry the, the gospel to all the nations, we can do our own part and we can do all that we can uh, to spread the, the, the gospel because uh, this is the work of the church, the church of all time and of all ages. And uh, he goes to India and his, just his story is, is riveting. This man uh, ends up translating the Bible in in, uh, I can't remember the number, but it's a ridiculous amount of, num- of, of languages that he learned, and he would translate the New Testament and go on to the next language. And uh, it's amazing all that, he, all that he did. So I highly recommend the, that uh, biography of William Carey. But let's go ahead and turn uh, in the book of Acts. And uh, also, I wanted to say, tonight is the last opportunity for any of you to sign up for lunch next week. We have that... Um, baptism uh, lunch here in church first and then we go to the Melhorn house to eat so if you want to contribute something please sign up uh, tonight of course I know that in the end people are just going to bring food that they didn't sign up for and it'll it'll be fine Uh, but we'll have a lot of food that we don't need probably Um, Acts chapter 2 and uh, uh, the the part of the book of Acts that we're coming to uh, tonight really uh, recounts the, uh, the first in-gathering of men into the kingdom after Christ's ascension. Uh, this is the, 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 first, the first pulling of a white net when uh, as many as 3,000 people are added to the records of God's people in a single day. So what you're getting here is really the true first great awakening heard of the Great Awakening in, uh, in America and how many people were saved. Uh, but this is the true first Great Awakening, when in a single day, 3,000 were brought to saving faith. 3,000 received new life, were forgiven of their sins. And when you think of that, this is uh, something that you and I should be aspiring towards, something that we should be uh, uh, wanting, longing to see in our own day. We always want to wait and we want to pray and we want to hope for awakening, for God himself to start uh, uh, radically saving many sinners uh, all at once. He can do that and he does do it at different points in history. Uh, but the, one of the things that we need to also be aware of is that we need to understand the nature of true repentance, what it means truly to come to Jesus Christ, what it means really to forsake your sins. Because there is such a thing as man-made false awakenings. They happen all the time. They're sort of induced by the will of man, induced through manipulation. We see them all the time. Um, uh, One that that comes to mind immediately is the uh, revival of Asbury University that took place, I believe, last year. And uh, it became clear sometime after that had started that uh, this was not a work of God. This was induced by men. They, they, they actually have a tradition in that place of, of awakenings and revivals. And it became clear uh, that this wasn't, this wasn't of God. This was uh, uh, perhaps some good things happened there, but it was uh, produced by men. So... If we are going to be able to spot the real thing, we need to understand the nature of true repentance. And so we want to do that tonight. We want to talk about saving repentance. Uh, what, what is it that you need for a, a truly breaking with your sins? 
And I actually just want to focus on one verse this evening. I want to focus on verse 37 of Acts 2. The, the Word of God says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? This is a, a, an amazing verse. And, and from these words, uh, you can make out at least three elements, three Three steps that lead up to true repentance, true, genuine, salvific repentance. You have to have all three, by the way. This is like the, like the legs on a stool. If you have one that is missing, the whole thing falls. You have to have these steps. And the first one, uh, the first step that you need here for genuine repentance to take place, we're going to refer to as hearing. Hearing, hearing the truth. Verse 37, again, it says, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. The, the demonstrative pronouns here refers to Peter's sermon. They heard Peter's sermon. He proved, as we know, as we've been seeing in this sermon, that Jesus of Nazareth had, in fact, been the Messiah that Israel always had waited for. And, and then Peter noted that his audience, they killed him. They killed him. And, and he testifies along with the 11 that are standing with him, that God had raised him up and that he is now alive and that God is going to make his enemies a footstool for his feet and that he has exalted him. That's the message that this crowd is hearing. But to be sure, when um, Luke says that they heard this, he means a, a, a very specific kind of hearing. It certainly doesn't re refer to the bare reception of the sounds without any apprehension of the words. A wife would know what I'm talking about, right? Your husband is looking at you, and he's nodding, and for some reason you still have to ask him, are you really listening to me? You suspect that the sound waves are coming out of your mouth are actually causing his eardrum to vibrate, but his mind is not really processing the message. Uh, or, or, or if it's processing it, it is processing it so imperfectly that he understands parts of it, but he doesn't understand the whole. And that happens, by the way, all the time in preaching. Uh, in fact, when Christ uh, gave the parable of the sower in Matthew 13, what was the very, that was the, what was the first kind of hearer that he mentioned? It was the, the one who does not understand. Uh, Matthew 13 19. Uh, in verse 18, he begins the explanation of the parable of the sower. And he says, Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. So the very first hearer, or the very first um, group that he identifies here is um, the one who does not hears a word, his eardrums vibrate, but the message is not really uh, doesn't really go in, and he lists this group first because most people actually fall into this category. The the eardrums ring with the message of the truth, but they simply don't understand it. Why? Well, Jesus likened them to a road, the road beside a field. A path beaten hard by foot traffic and baking sun. This is uh, stated here in verse 3. And he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, the sower went out to sow, and he, as he sowed, some seeds fell beside the road. And the birds came and ate them up. So the first kind of hearer is compared to the road. The road. A path beaten hard by foot traffic and baking sun. We often talk about different kinds of soil uh, in which the seed of the word falls. But actually the very first kind is not soil, it's a hard road. It's not really uh, soil. What happens there is that sin has so hardened your heart, that you cannot even understand the Word of God. It doesn't register. Sin, as we know, affects the understanding. Ephesians 5, 6 says, you were, in, you were darkness at once. Uh, this is why Proverbs 18, 2 says that the fool 
has no delight in understanding, but only in expressing his own mind. Let me give you an, an illustration of that. Acts chapter 17, 32. This is where when Paul is, uh, goes to Athens and he is brought into the Areopagus to preach to the Athenians. This is a, a very interesting account because this is one of the few places where Paul preaches the gospel and there is no church at the end, right? There is no church of Athens. He moves on, perhaps because the amount of people who believed was so small. But he preaches the gospel there to the Athenians. Um, and uh, verse 32 says that as soon as he mentions the resurrection from the dead, some begin to sneer. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. Uh, they began to mock. Perhaps, again, this is the majority because this is the first group listed. They mocked. Because what was happening here is that for the Greeks, matter was inherently an evil thing. And so any worldview that had a positive conception of the physical world was inherently foolish. Something that you did not even pay attention to. Something that you just blocked out. This would have been as offensive as, uh, and even seemingly ridiculous, as a preacher today um, walking into Harvard or Yale in their auditorium and stating that God created the world 6,000 years ago. They would just l look at you like you were crazy. Uh, it, this is the kind of offense that Paul caused here. And so... They, they just stopped listening immediately. They, they hear he's preaching, and he says resurrection, and the lights go off. Uh, this is like, like, like sounding the smoke alarm in some place. It, it, the, all the sounds just go off, and the mind is evacuated. I'm done listening. That's what happened. No, no further questions. And this is part of what sin does in the sinner. It builds defenses for itself. It creates a fortress into which the sinner is, uh, the, the soul of the unbeliever is in that fortress and it can't penetrate it. Um, John chapter 8 verse, verses 43 and 44, Jesus said, Why do you not understand what I am saying? It is because you cannot hear my word. You are of the father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. You want to do what you want and you've built a fortress around your own soul to keep out the truth. So you have to, you will tune out. When you hear the, the truth of the gospel, in, the, the truths that, that threaten your own desire, you just, your mind just stops working. It, it, it stops working. It doesn't receive anymore. This is, a, of course, a problem with the unregenerate mind. Again, hard soil or a paved road. Uh, but again, this is going back to our text in Acts 2. Something's, something's happening with this group, right? They're not like the Athenians who began to sneer. It says, rather, they heard this and they were pierced to the heart. Something supernatural is taking place. The Spirit of God. This is what's happening beyond, uh, beyond the surface. The Spirit of God is actually cracking open the road and the seed of the Word has gone in. John chapter 16 8. 8 uh, says that when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. So this is the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the third person of the Trinity, not the Father, not the Son, but He is God. And as God, He has the power to override any internal defense mechanism that the sinner has built for himself. He can actually enlighten the mind and cause the sinner to understand all at once to listen all at once. He can awake the sinner to the reality of his situation. You know, a man could be too drunk uh, for you to sort of wake him up simply by screaming and tell him that his house is burning. But the spirit is like the, the firefighter that comes in and just hoses the man down and uh, makes him wake up and notice that things are burning around you. Watch out. Walk away. It says again that, that he convicts Conviction, by the way, conviction is a charge that sticks, right? The, the, the Jews repeatedly accused Jesus of sin, but they never convicted him because he was not a sinner. He could not sin. And so the charge never stuck. And so uh, a conviction 
and for there to be a conviction, the person has to be has to have it demonstrated to themselves that you are in fact guilty. Uh, this spirit shows you again, as it says in John sixteen eight, that you're a sinner. He convicts of sin. Uh, he convicts also of righteousness, meaning you're a sinner, but you shouldn't be one because God is holy and He expects perfection from His creatures. But then it says that He convicts not only of sin and of righteousness, but also of judgment. Because you're not righteous, you are headed for judgment. You're a sinner, you shouldn't be, you should be righteous, and therefore you're headed for judgment. That's the work of the Spirit. Sin, righteousness, judgment. And that's what's happening in our text. Because the crowd, they don't just hear the sound of the words and then misinterpret the words. And crowds, by the way, had done that before. You might remember in the triumphal entry, the Father speaks from heaven. And what do the crowds say? They say he had thundered. They blocked off the message. But not this group. Now, this group, they're, they're, something else is happening because they're actually hurting as a result of Peter's message. They, they, this gets a reaction from them. This is uh, what leads me to my second point here, leading to repentance. The steps leading to repentance. And we can call it that, hurting, hurting. So you have hearing and then you have hurting. Acts 2.37, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart. The, uh, the, the verb to pierce. Here, very rare, appears only once in the New Testament. Uh, it, means, it means to prick with a sharp point. The, the classical Greek writers, they would use it for puncturing something with a spear. Uh, one of the few times that this verb is actually used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, is in Genesis 34, 7, the account of the, the reaction of the sons of Jacob to the rape of Dinah, their sister. It says that they were grieved. This was intense emotional pain. Could not believe it. And here is a similar emotion here. But this one is actually intensified because it doesn't just say that they were grieved. It doesn't just say that they were cut, but it rather says that they were cut all the way to the heart. They were really, really shocked to the core. They were stabbed at the heart. And all of this is uh, caused by the Word of God, right? What, what is it that pierced them? Well, the Word of God. Ephesians 6, 17, Hebrews 4, 12, speak of the Word as the sword, the sword of the Spirit. The, and the Spirit is uh, the one who uses this sword to devastate these people. Suddenly, out of nothing, these people are wounded on the inside. We say, well, why? What, what is it about Peter's preaching that caused them so much anguish? What is it that all of the sudden just brought all this pain and all this suffering? The answer is, first of all, that they, were, they had killed their own Messiah. The one that they had been waiting for so long. All the people of God waiting so long for Messiah to come. Messiah came and you killed him. That's devastating. Uh, um, Jacob waited seven years to marry Rachel. And lo and behold, he gets Leah. And so that's, that's a, that would have, would have been a, a horrific situation. Something like that is happening here, but way worse. They had been waiting so long for the Messiah, and lo and behold, they killed him. No more Messiah. But on the other hand, Peter t tells them that God had raised him up. So there is a Messiah. He's alive. But he then adds, that God, having exalted him, is going to make all of his enemies a footstool for your feet. Now imagine, you killed him. Who are the enemies? You. That's a problem. So, so these people would have felt the, the wrath of God on their own, over their own heads. They're liable to eternal condemnation. God is exalting him. God raised him up. God is exalting him. He's going to come after me. I was the one who killed him. I am the enemy that I had read throughout all my life. Reading the scriptures and seeing that one day the, the, the Lord of David would have all of his enemies crushed uh, uh, underneath his own feet. And all of a sudden you realize, oh, that's me. That's me. And so they were grieved. It makes sense. They were pierced. But again, the, in true repentance, you always have to have this element of sorrow. This is all over the scripture. Psalm... 
31, 10. I'm gonna, I'm gonna have you flip to a few passages. So uh, get ready for the sword drills. Uh, Psalm 31, 10. Notice it says, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity and my body has wasted away. So there's the relationship between sin and pain. Uh, turn over to Psalm 38, verse 2. For your arrows have sunk deep into me, and your hand has pressed down on me. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. For, I, for my iniquities are gone over my head as a, he, as a heavy burden. They weigh too much for me. My wounds grow foul and fester because of my folly. I am bent over and greatly bowed down. I go mourning all day long. So again, there is a relationship between uh, repentance and a sorrow, deep sorrow. Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 50. And this is uh, the kind of thing that uh, the typical uh, preaching of our day does not point out. There is no desire for the people to grieve over their sin, but there is this flippancy, this flippancy in preaching. Just don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Just, you believe you're good to go. Just don't dwell on anything. Uh, don't be sad about anything. And yet, there's so, so many times this happens in, in Scripture. Jeremiah 50, verse 4. In those days and at that time, declares the Lord, the sons of Israel will come, both they and the sons of Judah as well. They will go along weeping as they go, and it will be the Lord their God they will seek. They will ask for the way to Zion, turning their faces in its direction. They will come that they may join themselves to the Lord in an everlasting covenant that will not be for, forgotten. Here's a, prom a promise of salvation and a prophecy of great things to come. And it begins by the people coming, and as they're coming, they're weeping, seeking God. Weeping is a good thing. Uh, uh, Zechariah. Zechariah. I'll give you one more. Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10. This is uh, the one book before Malachi, the last one of the Old Testament. Uh, it says in Zechariah 12.10, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication so that they will look on me whom they have pierced and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. And that day there will be great mourning in Jerusalem like the mourning of Hadadramon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself and their wives by themselves, the family of the, of the Shima, Shimeites by itself and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself and their wives by themselves. So he, notice the, the, the connection here. The pouring of the Spirit. The Spirit is poured. And these people have grace. And finally, they can pray. They had never prayed before. But now they have the Spirit of supplication. They have the Spirit of prayer. For the first time, they can pray. And yet, what is it that, that's happening? They look on Jesus. Right? When God causes you to be born again, immediately it's, it's a looking at Jesus Christ. Because it is through Jesus Christ that you are justified. And so they look to Jesus, but as they're doing so, they're also mourning. Mourning, grieving. So again, there's so many passages that speak to this. That, that there's mourning to true repentance. Even if that doesn't show up immediately 
uh, at the time of salvation. I understand some people can go through a, through a period and they're not really even sure as to when their justification took place because it wasn't as clear. It's, it's more like a period of, in time. But even then, uh, at some point along the line, there will be a, an experience of grief, of my sin. The more I see my sin, I'm grieved. Uh, but then I also look back at Christ and I say, what a great Savior He is. And I'm overwhelmed by His goodness. And yet again, I see my sin and oh, wow, that is so grievous to me. How have I offended this dear God? But this is why Matthew 5, 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But again, um, not every sorrow is actually a sorrow that leads to salvation. Uh, not every grief is a saving grief. We need to make that distinction. Just because somebody is hurting doesn't mean this person has been saved. Even when so somebody is hurting over their sin. Turn over to 2 Corinthians Chap 2 Corinthians chapter 7. And we're going to begin reading in verse 9. Notice what happens here. 2 Corinthians 7, 9. I now rejoice, not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. Now, in the context here, this is what was happening. Paul had sent a letter to the Corinthians that he himself... Uh, refers to as the severe letter. Uh, they had embraced false teachers. They had been disloyal to the Apostle Paul. They had uh, begin, begun to embrace a false gospel. And so they, uh, he ends up having to, to send them a letter that was very strong, very severe. The letter didn't survive. It's not 1 Corinthians. It's a letter that comes after that. But, but we know... Uh, that that would have been a very strong letter. So strong, in fact, that it made these people mourn. But the apostle points out here that, that it was that mourning that actually led them to repentance. And he says that this is a sorrow that was according to the will of God. In other words, this is the kind of sorrow that God actually wants. So there is a sorrow that is according to God's will. In other, in other words, there is a sorrow that God wants you to have. Right? And this is the one that they had. Uh, it, it produces, he says, repentance without regret. Have you ever met somebody who repents of his repentance? I mean, obviously, the, uh, apostasy is, is this, right? You said at one point, I've repented of my sins and I'm sorry and I, I'm sorry of what I did and all of a sudden you're back doing the same thing and you don't care. Right? You've repented of your repentance. And so, but he's saying, though this is the, the kind of sorrow here that I'm talking about leads to a, to a repentance that, that it is not repented of. And that, that kind of sorrow is the sorrow that God wants you to have, according to the will of God. A repentance without regret. In other words, a repentance without regret is a repentance that actually endures. It leads to, as it says here, salvation. Salvation, by salvation, Paul doesn't mean justification, but rather you might want to think of it as, just, uh, as glorification, right? You make it, you repent, and you never, you never repent of your repentance, but rather you keep going, and at the end, you uh, make it all the way through. You persevere, you run the race, you fight the good fight, you keep the faith, you get the crown. Hey, someone, on the other hand, doesn't persevere, so he has a repentance, and the repentance then he repents of, and that means he never was justified in the first place, because all who are truly justified will be glorified, right? This is Romans 8. So, but, but those who do fall along the way, who repent of their repentance, uh, they have a kind of sorrow that produces death. And, and that, that sorrow is, is defined here, as uh, the sorrow of the world. It's, it's of the world because, uh, because 
it, it has in view this present life only. So you're hurting, you're sorry, but you're only sorry that you got caught. Uh, or you're only sorry that you're not going to get what you wanted anymore. Does that make sense? It, it, it's not a sorrow that's based on you're hurting your creator or, or, or you're uh, being an, an, uh, an offense to the God who made you and who feeds you and who has given uh, his own son for the grace for salvation. Uh, he, that this sorrow of the world is, is based on I'm not getting something anymore in this world. I, I feel sorry I got caught. Uh, and, and it leads to death. The supreme example, of course, of this is Judas Iscariot. He feels remorse that he's betrayed Jesus. So much remorse that he actually tries to make things right. He returns the money. He says this man is innocent. And yet what happens, ultimately, it led him to death. It wasn't a sorrow leading to salvation. It never got him to the place where he said, but Jesus will forgive me. This is what happened with, with, uh, with Peter, right? Peter was restored. Peter did tr entrust himself in, uh, to the Lord and said, Lord, you know that I love you. He continued to wait upon the grace of Jesus, but not Judas. No, Judas uh, was still turned over on himself. He uh, had no faith in Christ as his savior. And so he ends up killing himself. So uh, what I'm trying to say here is you have to be careful to distinguish a work of conviction from a work of grace, right? A, a person may be under conviction of sin and yet not have a work of grace done in their soul. Uh, and, and this happens often. A person is convicted over sin, feels bad for his sin, and begins to do the things that Christians do. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to want to get baptized. I'm going to do X, Y, or Z. I'm going to be nice to other people. I'm going to try to live this. I'm going to try to read my Bible. Uh, all of those things a regenerate person might do. But a person under conviction can also do those things. Uh, and yet, the problem is that the person under conviction has not yet been born again. The, uh, the desires have not changed. You're just, you're just trying to do some things to feel better about yourself. You, you feel the weight of your sin and your guilt. You're weighed down by them. And so you try to do some things to, uh, to attenuate the, the feeling, the, 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 the sorrow. But uh, uh, there is a distinction there. A person who has a work of grace is actually looking beyond themselves and seeing Christ. Here's Christ. Christ takes away my guilt. Christ is the only one who can cleanse me. And so my sin has brought me to the feet of the Savior. So the, the question that we have to ask when, when somebody's under a conviction of sin, the question that you have to always ask is, has your heart changed? Have you been born again? Uh, do you have new affections, new loves? Uh, do you love now? Christ? Do you want with all of your heart Christ himself? Have you traded all things for the pearl of great price, Christ? That is where the, the point, this is where you touch the thing with a needle. Where are you with respect to Jesus Christ and are you a new creature? And all of this uh, is related to my last point because how do you know that you have the, the the steps necessary for repentance. Well, you have hearing, you have hurting, and then you have the, the final one is really uh, a humbling of one, oneself. So hearing, hurting, humbling. Uh, again, look at the text, Acts 2.37. And when they heard this, they were uh, pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Notice, they, they, they use the title brethren here, a title of affection. They were embracing Peter and the apostles as their own. This is a, the, a very different reaction than that of the Sanhedrin. Uh, notice Peter preach, preaches to them in uh, chapter 5. 
And just look at their reaction in uh, chapter 5, verse 33. When they heard this, Peter's preaching to the Sanhedrin. When they heard this, they were cut to the quick, right? Pierced to the heart. Very similar expression. Cut to the quick. But what happened? They intended to kill them. Very different. Actually, the opposite. The other people are saying, brothers, brothers, you're, I, you're my brother. You're my own. These people are saying, I'm going to kill you. Uh, and then if, and Stephen, the same Sanhedrin, look at their reaction to Stephen, chapter 7, verse 54. Peter, uh, uh, Stephen stands in front of the Sanhedrin and preaches just like Peter had. And by this time, they're even, they're even angrier. Chapter 7, verse 54. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick again. And they, what? They began gnashing their teeth at him. And so, of course, they kill Jesus. Being full of the Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. It's not so interesting that the, the Son of God had said to have been seated. And Peter looks before he's about to die and he sees him standing. This is because the Son of God, he intercedes for us. He sits. Uh, we heard this at the, at the conference yesterday. He sits in that he has completed your, re your redemption in that the atonement is a once for all thing it's done so he sat down he's done and yet when you think of the imagery of him standing he is standing to make intercession for you and so he sees the savior standing and he knows the savior is about to get me into his kingdom so anyway this is uh what we, what you have here a bad reaction by the sanhedrin they they gnash their teeth uh uh, Stephen, and they killed him. And, and so the opposite of that is a humbled heart. Uh, you know, the, 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 the heart that is proud is uh, hostile even to the messenger, right? Uh, because as John tells us in John 3, that, that man loves his evil deeds, and if you love your evil deeds, you don't want to be exposed. Why? Because you don't want to give them up on the first place, but it may also be that, that you have the shame uh, and the punishment that, that are associated with your sin. And so even that, uh, for that reason, you don't want them exposed. And so you even hate the person who's exposing you because this is the person who's exposing the shame that you should be feeling and the fact that you have this guilt, that you, this sin that you need to give up. And so... It causes hatred. But again, these people, they're not doing that. No, they're embracing Peter and the apostles as their own. They're saying, brethren, what shall we do? Uh, by the way, this is obviously an admission, clear admission of guilt. Uh, Peter is saying, you killed the Messiah. And they're not disputing the charges here. No, they're asking, what could they do now that they in fact had ter committed this terrible thing? Is there any hope for me? Is there anything that I can do? I mean, this is beyond dispute that they had done what they were being charged of doing. They just want to know at this point, is there mercy? Is, is there grace? Can I be forgiven of this? They're not trying to justify themselves. They're not even saying that they didn't know that Jesus was the Messiah. I can imagine so many people sort of responding that way. He didn't look like a king. How dare you? They're not trying to do that. They're not arguing for themselves at all. They're saying, what do we do? What do we do? So the, the point here is godly repentance. It doesn't even try to save face. You don't try to make excuses for yourself. Uh, no, you acknowledge God is true and I am wrong. Psalm 38 verse 5. I acknowledge my sin to you and my iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Now, apart from this being an admission of guilt, the, the question, what shall we do, is also an admission that fixing what they had broken was beyond them. They're saying, you, you tell me what to do. This is beyond me. You gave me the diagnosis. You might as well give me the cure. I can't do it on my own. 
They're, they're, they're ad, 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 admitting this, so they're humbling themselves. And they're prepared to do whatever God asks them to do to make things right. You know, um, 2 Corinthians 7, 11, I won't have you turn there, but, but Paul, again, speaking of this sorrow that leads to life, he says that it produces earnestness, vindication, indignation, fear, longing, zeal, avenging of wrong. So you want to make things right. And, and all of these things are wrapped up in this question that these people were asking. So what they were doing is they were putting themselves at the mercy of God. Is there mercy for me? What do I do? They're not trying to do something they're under, in, them, in their own or by their own power. They're not trying to justify themselves. They're just casting themselves into the arms of God and saying, what do, what do I do? What do I do? And so... This is, uh, this is what, in, what, what it means to have a godly repentance. Saving repentance, it involves hearing the word of God with faith and mourning and a humbling of oneself. This is what we see in the story of the Ninevites, don't we? Back in the book of Jonah. The, 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 the most massive awakening ever recorded in history is the awakening that took place in Nineveh. And uh, Jonah preaches to them, and it says that they believed God, an entire generation of Ninevites believed God. They, they heard the prophet, but they knew it was God speaking to them, and they believed God. This is what shows you the, how when, when somebody receives the word of God, they know it's God speaking, it's not man. So it says they believed in God. And, and then what do they do? They, they mourn. The king pro proclaims a fast. They put on sackcloth and ashes. They say, perhaps God will have mercy on us. Again, putting themselves. They're not saying God has to have mercy on us. No, perhaps God will have mercy on us. They're putting themselves entirely in the mercy of God. And so may God give us to see this kind of thing, not some flippant Revival that um, makes promises that can't keep. You hear preachers talk like that all the time. Pray this prayer with me. And if you pray that prayer with me, you're saved. Don't worry. And then they turn around next morning and show up and say, you should never question your salvation. If you prayed that prayer, you should never question anything. And yet that's not how, that's not how it works. We understand that. That is not how it works. It is the Spirit who has to testify with our spirits that we are children of God. You can't talk yourself into this. You may be able to do that for five minutes, but eventually reality is going to settle in. And so this is a work of God, even the assurance to know that you are a child of God. This is a work of God, a gift of God. The Spirit does this work according to His own will. When He wants, He may actually have you struggle for a little while. And that is his work, his mysterious work that he does for his own purposes. Um, but otherwise, may we see in our own day a kind of work like that, uh, in which men actually mourn for their sins. Thomas Watson, the Puritan, said that, that uh, something to this extent, I don't have the quote here, but, but he said that man should mourn for his sin as intensely as he took delight in it when he was sinning. And so may we see ourselves, uh, may we ourselves mourn over our sins in that way, and may we see others also and see a great revival in our day. We should pray to that extent. Let's pray. We ask you, O oh God, that you would cause a great work among us, that beginning in our own church, beginning in our own lo local assembly, we might see um, men and women mourning for their sins and uh, beholding the majesty of the great God who is so pure, who is infinitely holy. And from there, seeing their own sin and from there, seeing the greatness of the Savior. We want Jesus to have his rule extended. We want subjects to be added to his kingdom. And we pray 
to that extent now. Uh, we pray in his name. Amen.